to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Kicking off our show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. We may or may not have been sitting here watching some stuff. <laughs> watching that stuff with him, John Schnepp. Man, if we should do a pre-movie talk show, because we get so nerdy and sweaty, and then like, <laughs> quiet, quiet. We're going to start the show, but like literally geeking out like children for like five minutes. What's up? <laughs> also joining us, Jeremy John. Uh, uh, springboarding off of that is completely true. We watch nerdy stuff and it's like, all right, we're starting in five. We're like, <clears throat> professional. <laughs> Getting so serious all of a sudden. And also joining us, Christian Harloff. Fine, I'll tell him we're watching loops of Rick Roll. <laughs> just lots of Rick, <laughs> Rick Roll. Roll. <laughs> all right, guys, uh, sometimes things happen that we forget to get into the sidebars here so natasha what's our first thing up okay our first thing up the upcoming power rangers reboot from lionsgate has finally given us our first look at brian cranston's zordon character through an interactive vr film at ces 2017 currently underway in las vegas the image originally posted to the official power rangers now website shows that the zordon character has been changed from a blue head in a tube to a blue head over a rock formation although the image isn't clear enough to be definitive we'll get a better look at the character when power Rangers hits theaters on March 24th. John, what do you think about the first look at Brian Cranston's Zordon character? You know what? Look, I, I try to call things as I see them, all right? And it's no big secret that I have been very critical of even the whole idea of this movie being made. I, I thought it was a bad idea. I still kind of do. Uh, I don't know if, if it'll work. I don't think there's as much interest there as everybody th seems to think there is. But that trailer came out, and I, I liked it. I, I'm going to call it as I see it. I liked it. And you know what? When I saw this, the first thing that came to my mind was, you know what? It's probably a good thing that, I mean, they should take liberties if they feel they need to, but I feel like the the disembodied floating head of Zordon, that's something you don't change. That's something you probably keep and figure out a way to fit it in. And I saw this and I thought, this works. I, I think this works. Now, I still have all my apprehensions about this Power Rangers movie. I do. But if I'm going to be honest, I've liked the trailer so far. Mm -hmm. I like this image. I think this is pretty cool. And if you're somebody like me who's really skeptical of it, you have to acknowledge, hey, there are a few pathways here that this could actually end up being pretty good. And look, all the stuff they're doing is doing what it was designed to do. Change skeptics into people who have some optimism and I'm starting to feel a little bit of optimism. I'm not willing to buy into it just yet, but I have to admit I'm liking what I'm seeing. What do you think, Schnepp? Um, you know, having not grown up watching the Power Rangers, I've never been a fan of the Power Rangers, but I actually like the trailer. When they released that trailer, it looked it was like a combination of Chronicle and I Know What You Did Last Power Ranger, whatever. Had a bunch of <laughs> had a bunch of like mystery to it or whatever. And I was like, wow, you know what? For a Power Rangers movie, this I'm interested. I'm going to see this film. Um, this image reminds me of I Am the Great and Powerful Cranston. It very <laughs> much is a Wizard of Oz thing, but I'm okay with it. So was Zordon in the first place. Totally. Ones, yeah. I'm completely cool with this vi this version of Zordon, and I, it just goes along with the trailer that I already saw and the Rita Repulsa images and stuff that I've seen. Right. Where it feels like, okay, it's going to have, it's obviously going to be Power Rangers. You know it's those five people in their like kind of Iron Man, Guyver suits. But it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun, so I buy the image for Jeremy, sure. Jeremy, where are you at right now? Well, as someone who did watch Power Rangers and may or may not currently own the Legacy Megazord and Legacy Thunderzord on my shelf right mm. now, I'm looking forward to this movie. Whether or not it's going to be good, I have no idea. But for me, myself, I have to see a new movie. When I first saw this image, I thought one thing. He looks like a... Uh, Zordon looks like Frank Langella from Masters of the Universe, oh, doesn't yes. he? Looks like Skeletor. <laughs> he does. He looks like Skeletor's head just floating and there. Frank Langella in that movie was awesome. He uh, was. Uh, he well, was. yeah, he, Langella was great. Yes, yes, he was. <laughs> yeah, he, he was great in that movie. Um, I want to know how many people did what I did was when they saw this image on their phone, tried to blur their eyes to make it look 3D. I, I did. Um, <laughs> And it looks like they're in some shady cave, which I hope, I kind of hope they're in a cave because if mm. there is a building that's a command center, I feel like Reed would be like, so that's where they are. Let me send a bomb there right now and just blow the whole thing up. So I want their command center to be a little more isolated, a little more incognito. Mm. What do you think, Christian? I'll tell you, when I saw it, because I 
Jeremy, you've been looking forward to the movie because you're a Power Rangers fan. Right. I saw the trailer, and I'm really looking forward to this movie because, like you said, with Chronicle, but I did get a Wizard of Oz feel for sure, but then I got a bit of Superman 2 Cave for sure in there oh, mixed yeah, with Zordon yeah, yeah, doing yeah. that blue meth because look at, <laughs> look at that guy. Look at that guy. It looks like. Yeah, that's, you have, right. that's Walter White's new hideout, man. Oh, that's it's, amazing. It's, no, it's cool because the thing is, I think that if I would have seen this image before the trailer, I'd be like, I don't know. It's just right. kind of a weird floating head. I, don't, I have no idea. But knowing what the tone, I can't imagine that it'd be such a dramatic shift that this is going to come off corny. It looks like it's going to fit the tone of what they said so far. Totally. So I think it's a great image. I think the, the new biggest trending hashtag has to be Zordon's blue meth. I think that's what we get. Now, <laughs> probably the, one of the bigger Power Rangers fans in our office is Wendy. So, Wendy, like you've seen the trailer now, and now you see this image. What do you think about it? I actually like it a lot. I mean, I think it calls back to the original Zordon, but still keeping a fresh look on it. So I think it's like a really updated Power Ranger. I think fans from the original series are still going to like it, and I think it's going to invite new viewers to hopefully enjoy this movie. I'm looking forward to it. Now, Saber look, Tooth I, Tiger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and look, I, I don't want to get carried away here, okay? Look, I, I still think what I think. We're just talking about a trailer, and we're just talking about a still True. image. But just, you know, to be fair, if I'm going to be honest about my critical nature about this movie gotta be honest when they put out stuff that's starting to look good and i'm gonna say they're they're getting there with me ever so slowly right. they're getting there with me all right natasha what's next argo and allied producer graham king along with fundamental films announced that they are partnering with deadpool co-creator rob liefeld to produce a movie based on his extreme universe comic series akiva goldsman has also been brought on to develop the property that is being eyed as a shared universe film franchise goldsman will set up and oversee a writer's room like he did with hasbro and paramount's transformers franchise there's no word on what the first movie will be about or what character will be central to the film launch. John, what do you think about a shared universe based on Liefeld's Extreme Universe comic series? Uh, does everything have to be shared universe? <laughs> does everything have to be shared universe, especially when you haven't proven one film? Number one, you haven't even proven you can actually get one film onto the screen yet. Okay, so let's start with there. Then, if you do get one film onto the screen, does the audience actually like it? My concern here is... Like, when you looked at, say, Iron Man, okay? Iron Man was a great standalone film. It completely stood on its own, notwithstanding the after credit scene of, you know, Nick Fury coming in and talking about the Avengers Initiative, okay? That, not, that notwithstanding, it was a movie that was made in such a way that it would facilitate a larger shared universe, but we got to see how this is going to play out, so let's make it completely a self-contained standalone film. And they did that, and it worked out great. I think they really should not be thinking shared universe at this point. Can they break in? Now, we've been talking for years about it would be nice to see a lot of these other comic titles that are not under the DC or Marvel banners to be able to get some big screen treatment. We've been hearing now for a couple of years of different things, but nothing's actually materialized. This sounds questionable to me. I don't know. Schnepp, what do you think? Well, I'll disagree as far as shared universe stuff when it comes to uh, like unified worlds like this is Rob Liefeld's world. The, the, right. These are all his under his extreme banner. So it makes sense that if someone's going to buy, say, Bloodstrike or Baboom, I wrote all of, all of the names down on this beautiful little puppy <laughs> paw stamp because I was like, so I mean, actually, I own some. We of these spared comics. no expense Zero around here. here. This is a lot of money, guys. This is very. It's not a yellow pad or a white pad. It's a paw pad. Um, Rejects, Brigade, a lot of a lot of comics that happened in the the late uh, mid 90s right. that nobody bought they're like called nickel comics they're not really worth anything you could do they're been the nickel bin or the quarter bin and a lot of these comics are in that bin but some of them aren't like i i was surprised that supreme isn't part of this package right. which was but i think that's already but been did somebody, somebody else already optioned yeah that, a lot I of think, other yeah. things have already been optioned off but this is what's left of that extreme universe so i think somebody was like let's bundle it together and i agree with you john i think they will make one film first whether they make brigade or a rejects or blood wolf They'll do one first, but then hopefully spin it off. Right. What do you think, Christian? Well, that's that's where I was going to go. With it. I think that I don't mind the idea of having a shared universe. I think that it's a little bit ambitious to announce the shared universe right away. Mm. I think 
I think it, it actually helps creativity to have a shared universe and say, well, look, if this thing is successful, let's plan it to go this, and then we can bring this person in, and we could have our own universe too. But by saying right away, it's going to be a shared universe because if that first movie sucks, then everyone's going, who cares about it? No one cares right. about the shared universe. Get it out of here. Right. But I think by planning it out is fine. I just don't think they necessarily had to do it publicly and say, this is going to be a shared universe. Yeah, it's a, it, I don't blame a studio for wanting to go to a shared universe. You know the board, they're all sitting down, all these producers are like, okay, there's a multi-billion dollar corner mm. for a market, we should probably do that, you know? But I do agree that you have to do it in strides, like do the one movie. If you look at Man of Steel, it wasn't a shared universe film yet. It, right. it itself is a standalone film. Even DC knew to do that. So yeah, you, you do the one movie, you see how it goes, then you do shared universe. It's probably a no-brainer if a comic book property of multiple characters is coming out. It's going to be a shared universe, but I agree, like, let's do the one. When I heard about this, I was so glad Schnepp was on here. I'm like, okay, he knows those comics, because all I knew about these comics is that they were the they were the comic book property in art class, right. where it was like <laughs> those kids, like there, there were a group of about five of them that all had those obscure comic books where you're like, oh, I, I don't know what that is. That's not Spider-Man. That's not Superman. But I uh, I like the moxie there, kid. So I'm glad you were on this panel for well, it, I was going to say a lot, of these, a lot of these characters are like sort of uh, different amalgamations of other superhero characters. Mm -hmm. Like I think Cybrid... When you just look at it as the Congo, you're like, ah, it's like, uh, you know, Wolverine meets Spawn meets this, that. But then if you just take a little spin on it, it could actually be a really cool film. So I think that's what Akiva Goldsman, just like he ran the writer's room for Transformers, he's doing the same thing with this property where he's going to have a writer's room where they develop all of these films, pick the one that they're going to lead with. And I think, you know, we're, you know, we've heard of all these other extracurricular Transformers films like Bumblebee, the R-rated cut, <laughs> stuff that's never going to happen. <laughs> right. But I think within this context, I think they're going to take what they've got, what's the best of this, you know, what's the best of all this and launch with that. Well, let's remember that last writer's room gave us a Transformers movies with Merlin fighting Hitler and Winston Churchill. It could be so, awesome. <laughs> we mean, don't know. Uh, yeah. Fingers crossed, I guess. Okay, what's next? According to Deadline, Sylvester Stallone is attached to direct and star opposite Adam Driver in Tough As They Come, based on the best-selling Travis Mills memoir. The drama tells the true story of U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Mills, one of only five soldiers to survive a quadruple amputation from a battlefield injury, with the soldier's relationship with his father-in-law, the central heart of the story. Driver will play Mills with Stallone playing his father-in-law. The movie is looking to be set up at Fox with a release date yet to be determined. Christian, are you excited about Stallone directing and and starring alongside Adam Driver in Tough As They Come. Uh, yeah, I am, because it, Jeremy and I were talking about this beforehand. The, the title just sounds like a slow movie. It's like, what do you want to call it? <laughs> Tough As They Come! <laughs> it, 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 you, you just hear it. Um, but I, I'm actually excited because it gets away from just the expendable stuff, or even as much as I love him playing Rocky Balboa, it gets away from that and shows what else he can do, because he's a pretty good director. I mean, some of the best Rocky movies are directed by him. Um, he, he, I think that he's he's got... What we saw in Creed, what we saw in Copland, he's, he absolutely can get those performances down. And I think that it's a nice shift for him to do, considering that all eyes were on him last Oscars. You know, Ryan Lance mm -hmm. got it, but all eyes were on Stallone. So I think by him doing something like this and teaming up with someone like Adam Driver, it's a smart move for his career right now. It's a good move for him directing. So, you know, hopefully it turns out pretty good. Yeah, you know what? I, and I like what he did. Although I didn't love the first uh, Expendables movie, I really did like what he did with that movie as a director and, and what he was going for and what he was trying to do. Then you look at Rocky II, Rocky III, Rocky IV, where was, and then he revitalized Rambo somehow in right. some way. Like, So I'm really curious. Adam Driver is turning into one of those actors you have to keep your eye on. And so to see Adam Driver... With the Stallone that we just saw in Creed, mm -hmm. and you, you mentioned what he was also able to do in films like right. Copland, when he's doing more dramatic stuff, he really can work a lot. I think this is really intriguing, so I'm interested in this a lot. Uh, he revitalized Rambo, and I'll tell you exactly how he did it. It's called the 50 Cal scene at the end. That is an amazing <laughs> scene, and is one of the best action scenes uh, I, I just watched. Just watch just that scene. But yeah, Stallone at a point became a gimmick. <laughs> Uh, with the Expendables movies, you know, like including the Expendables well, before movies. Before that, too. Yeah, yeah. it, it was kind of, he was the action gimmick. Of, oh, he's the old guy who still wants to be an action star. But the dude has layers to him if you can exploit that and, and even, you know, embrace that. And so he's not just uh, an action hero joke. The dude can do what this movie looks like it's going to do. I <laughs> think Christian's right. We were talking about it. I'm like, it all lines up to be a movie that's going for some sort of award, and it's called Tough as They Come. Yeah. But Adam Driver's a great actor. I agree. He's one to look out for the dude was actually in the military so mm. adam driver will will 
I think he'll fit into this really well. Everything except the title is something that I have no reason to not look forward to this, so I want to see what they do. Schnepp. Yeah, it's, I mean, especially when you look at the context of what it's about, a, a, a quadriplegic overcoming all these odds to live a normal life, deal with, you know, this kind of thing. I, I think Adam Driver is going to do a great job. I look forward to Stallone doing some serious material and less so like, I wanted to see a Rambo 6, I'm not going to lie. Or was it 5, 4, I can't even remember what Lost it was. Lost count. It would have been yeah. 5. Mm -hmm. I would have seen let Rambo 7, I would have seen it. But uh, I'm looking forward to this. All right, guys, it is Thursday, which means it's time for us to talk about what is opening this week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theatres. Now, on Tuesday, we talked about Underworld, but there are two other films opening wider this week. Natasha, what do we got? Hidden Figures, three brilliant African-American women at NASA serve as the brains behind one of the greatest operations in history, the launch of astronaut John Glenn into orbit, a stunning achievement that restored the nation's confidence, turned around the space race, and galvanized the world. A Monster Calls is also coming out this week. Connor O'Malley, played by Louis McDougall, is a young boy who tries to deal with the terminal illness of his mother, played by Felicity Jones, and the attacks by local school bully. One night, Connor encounters a monster voiced by Liam Neeson in the form of a giant humanoid tree who has come to tell him stories and Sue begins to help Connor fix his unhappy life. Uh, well, I, I have not seen Hidden Figures, although I am really intrigued. I've been intrigued about this movie since the first trailer. I'm really excited to see it. I can't wait. Monster Calls is a powerful movie. You've got to watch Monster Calls. No, probably not one you're going to go back to the theater to watch multiple times because it's... Ooh, I mean, it's, uh, uh, but it's it's brilliantly made, brilliantly done. So I am super interested in uh, in Hidden Figures. I'm going to run out to see that. Definitely, I'll probably go see that tonight. And uh, definitely, I would recommend Monster Calls. Yeah, I think you've seen them both. I've seen them both, and they're both really good and powerful films on both fronts. Like you're mentioning with Monster Calls, you know, Bayona just did such a great job with that movie, and Felicity Jones, um, and the young kid though really knocks you off your seat because he's just it's it's just there's so much to it the way that it looks the way that you feel emotionally um and i can say the same thing for hidden figures hidden figures is a very important story and it was funny because i was having the conversation with dennis who has not seen the movie yet and he's like i don't know about the title and i said i felt the same way at first but when you see what this movie's about the fact that all three uh strong african-american women who were hidden in the background, but what they did, how smart they were, how important they were, how important it was for us as a society that they were able to do these jobs, these roles. And I'm watching going, some of the math that they're doing, I'm like, if anyone relied on me to do that, it wouldn't even take it off, it would have blown up within three seconds. But like, so it is. It, it was all three of the ladies did such a great job. Kevin Costner puts in a pretty good performance. I could have done without Jim Parsons in this role, not because I don't like him, but I thought he was just very cliche. But overall, it's a really um, important story. What are you looking forward to, Shep? Uh, Hidden Figures. I saw Monster Calls, and I'm uh, you know, the minority here. I didn't like it. I, I found oh, wow. it to be they introduced the creature a little too early the stories didn't work for me i thought the kid was a good actor but to me it was very contrived and i could not emotionally wow. get involved in it hidden figures everything about it, it, it i love stories especially about the space race and going mm. into to the moon and, and glenn and all these stories and this is has a, a special niche for me as far as it's telling an untold story you know, so Jeremy. Yeah, I've seen Hidden Figures. Just put up my review of Hidden Figures, um, and I agree with you, Christian. It's it's such an important story that you would never hear about had cinema just not taken it on. You know, it's right, one of these right, stories right. that you'll. I love that movies can do that. Is take something in history that you're like, I you're ignorant to it. You don't know what even happened, and this movie can be like, here, here's what happened. You're like, that's. I feel super informed now. I'm really glad that someone took on that project and told me the story that I otherwise would never hear. It's like, a I, I never knew Hitler was killed in a movie theater arson attack. Yes. I never knew that. And now you know and that. And now I and know. And Quentin Tarantino yeah. brought us that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but, no, I'm not saying everything in film is truth, but I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that this movie can, can you know, show a bit of that. But uh, uh, Monster Calls, I'm really lo I'm looking forward to because I'm interested in it. Anytime a movie mm. can show... You know, someone dealing with pain in a way like that, with because I was a super imaginative kid. I never had a tree talk to me, but I probably had a few things. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, I, I feel like I'll connect to a Monster Calls. Uh, it, I hope I do in, in the way I feel like I can. All right, guys, we'll reach that part of the show now for Buy or Sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Natasha's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it 
or sell. So, Natasha, what do we got? According to Deadline, Stomp the Yard, Sylvain White has been set to direct Slender Man, the Screen Gems thriller based on the creepy pasta internet meme that became a viral sensation. The movie follows the tall, thin, horrifying figure with unnaturally long arms and a featureless face who is responsible for the haunting and disappearance of countless children and teens. Production looks to be starting this spring, though, uh, though a release date has been set. Schnapp, buy or sell a Slender Man movie with Sylvain White directing. I buy it. I mean, there's an HBO Slender Man documentary about, you know, the two little girls who, like, stabbed this other girl. And this is real life based on them, you know, t saying the Slender Man told them to do it. Now, the Slender Man is like a, a, a very recent mm -hmm. mythology. It comes out of the creepy pasta world of the Internet. Um, you know, I hate even saying creepy pasta. It bothers me. But uh, <laughs> so Slender Man, I, I buy that Sylvain White is going to be directing it because he did The Losers. He was in he was in line to direct the Frank Miller adaptation of Ronin. He was heavily involved in the production on that. That fell apart. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what he's going to add to this you know, new mythology. I buy this on several levels. Number one, I love the idea of this new mythology of the Slender Man. I think this is a great subject matter to make something. I think you could be fun and creepy and all that kind of stuff. That's great. But mostly, I'm going to admit, I'm buying this because this is the dude who directed The Losers. I think The mm -hmm. Losers is a tragically underappreciated film. I agree. I love that movie. If you want to see Negan at his best, you, Chris Evans is in there. Idris Elba is in there. Yeah. It's a great cast. It's fun. It's energetic. I love the feel he brought to it. And if he can bring that to like some kind of a creepy fun movie at the same time, bonkers. It's really funny you say The Losers. I never saw The Losers. It, I, I don't think it came to the theater I worked at at the time, but you look at the cast. The cast is the cast before they were the mm, cast. Yeah. They were just, you know, like, eh, I guess I'll be in this movie. Now it's an all-star cast. Saldana. Right, Sorry, right. Saldana's in there, yep. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I find it interesting that because I was thinking about oh Sleepy Hollow Headless Horseman of course that came about <laughs> back in the day because you know people you could make crap up and people would buy it and same with Dracula and the Wolfman and I'm like oh no I guess a couple years ago someone made up the Slender Man and people totally buy it so I guess you can still do that it's a fascinating thing culturally speaking the Slender Man I'm interested in a movie I would be more interested in a documentary but I'm fine I want to see a movie about the Slender Man let's let's dive into that mythos a bit yeah, I'm, I'm also going to buy it, and I think for the same reasons you said, John, I want to see what he's going to be able to do, because he hasn't directed a movie in, in right, since The Losers, yeah. right? So I want to see what happens here. The mythology sounds different, sounds interesting. Uh, little known fact, you know, The Losers was actually a Joel Silver movie, so it was like right, it was right after my time. So I remember watching that movie, and, and you, like you said, you go back and you look at that cast <laughs> now, that it, you, you're not making that movie for that amount of money. <laughs> no, <man. laughs> right. So to see this guy doing th this new movie, and even I'm not the big, I'm not the horror guy, but it, it might actually be something interesting to me, not in the, the slasher way. I always get interested when you like a horror movie, because I always keep my eye out on that. When a horror movie comes out, I want to watch your review, because I'm like, all right, did Christian, like, sometimes when you're like, I loved that movie, I'm like, you're a horror movie fan now, you have to right. deal with that right. fact. Right, well, The Conjuring. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. The Conjuring's the only horror movie I ever give five out of five to. I love that movie. <laughs> all right, what's next? According to The Wrap, Rachel McAdams is in negotiations to star in the New Line comedy Game Night alongside Jason Bateman and directed by Spider-Man Homecoming writers Jonathan Goldstein and John Francis Daly. Game Night is about a group of couples who gather for their regularly planned game night when something goes horribly wrong. No word on a production start date or release in theaters. Jeremy Byers saw the Game Night movie with Jason Bateman and Rachel McAdams. I gotta buy it. Both of these people have great comedic prowess to them. I love the fact that Game Night, it's pretty much what you described is my Friday night. If anyone's ever like asking, wait, what do you do on Friday nights? I'm like, my friends and I get together and we play Quiplash, and that's what we do. And so we're, we're, we're game night nerds. We're dorks. What can I say? But uh, yeah, yeah, everything lines up for the fact that Bateman is hysterical. He has great comedic timing. So does Rachel McAdams. You remember Wedding Crashers. I mean, mm. the two of them coming together, I got to buy this. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to buy it. I mean, I kind of want it to be like a weird, like they get sucked into the game Jumanji style, but for adults. <laughs> but you know that's not what it's going to be. It's going to, some, something goes wrong, some weird truth gets told, and then they, it's the truth or dare game night or whatever. Who knows what it's going to be, but I buy it, especially because Bateman's involved. He's shown himself to be a comedic genius, especially even with his, uh, what was it called, Bad wor Words? Bad Words, yeah. yeah that was like a I weird, weird words. film. Went really, went, you know, over the top, but I liked it. You know what's funny about this? Like, I saw this through 
the the spectrum of it being a comedy. What if it is a horror movie? The premise right. is something goes terribly wrong. <laughs> right. It'll be a horror movie, yeah. right? I I gotta buy this. Number one, Rachel McAdams, good Canadian girl, grew up a stone's throw from me, of course. And <laughs> the two guys, I'm not saying they are the best in the world, but the two guys I trust the most when I hear of, of a comedy coming out is Jason Bateman and probably Jason Segel. When, mm. when those guys' names are attached to it, I trust them. And even in comedies that Jason Bateman has been in that may not have fired on all cylinders, he always brings it mm -hmm. in these things. He's perfect for these types of movies. I love the idea of seeing him against Rachel McAdams. Just, of course, recently watched her again in Doctor Strange. So I buy this. What about you? I buy it. And look, you, you, this this just shows this uh, comedy, though, is really dependent on the stars and who's delivering on it. Because you can hear this with two comedians that you may not really enjoy. Like For me, I know a lot of people love Ben Stiller. If it was like Ben Stiller, and I don't know, not that I have anything against Elizabeth Banks, I, I like her, but if that was the cast, I'd be like, I don't know, we'll see. Jason Bateman, you're right. Sometimes he hits, sometimes he misses, but I'm always, I always give him the benefit of the doubt. But the teaming up of him and McAdams together, that to me goes, well, this could be pretty funny. It could be interesting. It could be a disaster because I look at, I like Melissa McCarthy and I like Jason Bateman, and that movie that they did together was gosh. Um, <laughs> but this movie, this could be fun. Sure. All right, what's next? Paramount has delayed Rings over four times in the past year and a half, but now it appears that finally the third movie in the franchise is ready to hit theaters. The studio Wednesday released the first poster for the film, confirming it will hit theaters in less than one month on February 3rd. The movie is directed by Javier Gutierrez and stars Vincent D'Onofrio and Johnny Galecki. John Byers saw the first poster for Rings. Well, it's not just a poster. A trailer is dropped as well. A brand new trailer for it is dropped. And looking at the poster and looking at the trailer and looking at the fact that it's been delayed four times, I, I'm going to sell it right now. The, the trailer wasn't terrible. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't enough to get me excited either. The poster, it, it looks like a Rings reboot thing. I mean, there's, right. there's nothing original. There's nothing new being brought to it in the poster. Artistically, it's, it's a nice looking poster. That's, that's a poster you can hang on your wall, I guess. But it's not bringing anything to the table. There's nothing in either the poster or the trailer that is going to take somebody like me who's a little bit skeptical about it because of all the delays and everything and move me into as to somebody who's excited about it. Hasn't done it, so for me, it's got to be a sell. Get it out of here. Sell. Uh, it, it is so generic. That it is so generic. Does it look like an awful movie? No, but it looks like I've seen it a billion times and you're just trying to cash in. How dumb is that tagline? First you watch it, then you die. I mean, come on. It's like, and then and now she's on the internet, and the girl's running through the internet. Like, if you got out of here. And then you have this stupid, it's that same image, the creepiest image in that first one in the ring that gave me chills. It was when she's coming through the TV, and it's like, she's doing it again. <laughs> Step on her like a bug. It's like, I, I, I hate it. It's just, get it, goodbye. Snap. First you watch it, then you cry. Yeah, I know. Um, oh. <clears throat> I'm going to see this. I, I want the trailer. This newest trailer is the one that sold me on. I don't care that's been delayed. It could have been delayed nine times. When I saw that trailer, I was like, it's got the good mirror jump scares that we've all seen in a million you know, horror movies, but they always work. Where the person's like, ha, ha, and then, ah, you know, so those always work. I think the return of what's her name again? Laguma, Lagrigla. What's her? What's the Samara? Thank you. Samara totally was not even in the right ballpark. Since <laughs> tonight, yeah. I was way off. Yeah, Goombly, whatever. Samara. Um, the return of her. I look forward to it. I know. I I'm half in Christian's ballpark, but I'm gonna kind of creep over and still buy it. Crawl. Just, I'm crawling. <laughs> I'm all cr with the leg up. Ooh. Yeah. Everybody yeah. yeah, thinks she'd just be in a better mood if somebody gave her a shower. <laughs> right. be, I don't know, Jeremy. I love the fact that, all right, there are like three things I want to touch on. I'm going to remember to touch on two of them. But we were watching this trailer earlier. There was this girl looking in the mirror. Christian literally queued up the jump scare and went like that, right? When she got <laughs> yeah. jump scared. It was really funny. Uh, yeah, like the, the fact that the tagline is the poster. It's like, oh, in case you didn't know, here you go. The thing that jumps out the most is the February 3rd release date. That's worked one and that was 10 Cloverfield Lane because right. you knew they kept that thing close to the vest and they were like, hey, guess what? By the way, this thing's coming out. You didn't know about it. I feel like it coming out in a month is them going, well, you, you, know, you got to roll with it. All the, It's, it's going to happen, whatever. Well, it's not a January movie. <laughs> no, it's uh, close uh, if, no, it's close uh, No, I'm selling this because if I didn't review movies, this wouldn't make me go, I'm going to see it because I review movies. But if I didn't review movies, I'd be like, eh, pass, stop, so, so. 
All right, guys, so listen, don't forget, we do this show live, and as such, we like to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. So you can start firing those questions in now. Just make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Start firing us some questions, and Wendy will pick some out to read at the end of the show. I also want to remind you that this is not the only show on Collider Video today. We also got the newest episode of Collider Jedi Council. Airs a little bit later today with this man over here. I'm going to be there, too, so make sure you join us for that. And, you know, we were just talking about a monster calls, and I love that film. I know a bunch of people really like it. And we were privileged enough to have the director of the film, J.A. Bayona, here in studio with us to talk a little bit about the film. Here's a clip of that interview. You're also talking to one of the biggest Jurassic Park fans out there. Mm -hmm. I must know that movie front to back, every single line of dialogue. And I had a lot of fun with Jurassic World, so I am so, so excited for you to put your stamp on that franchise now. Can you talk a little bit about just why that movie is next for you? Because I was also reading in the press notes for A Monster Calls that this this movie kind of completes a trilogy for you. So is that start a start of something new that you're going to explore going forward? Yeah, it's a second chapter of a trilogy, and I think uh, Colin Trevorov, he he wanted me to direct the, the second chapter, I think because of the orphanage. So I think he's. Uh, we, we're trying to do something. Is it a dino orphanage? Are there little baby <laughs> dinosaur orphans? Is that what it's about? I would probably watch that movie. <laughs> it, it is. It is going to be. It's supposed to be more scary and more and darker. Of course, you have Chris Pratt, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Hmm. But but I'm sure it's going to be uh, a little dark. Yes. And in addition to the original movie, I'm also a big fan of the book and. There's a lot of changes from the book to the movie. Is there anything you can mind that was not tapped, in, it tapped into with the book in the first film? In the Monster Calls? Uh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. In Jurassic World. In Jurassic. I mean, I, I, I just uh, read the books again from Michael Crichton, and, and I, really, I really like how he's all the time grounded and how he talks about science at the same time. Science uh, makes it real. So we really want to get there. I mean, uh, I, I went back to the books again. Too. Doesn't Malcolm die in the book and then he's alive again in the second book? There, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I feel bad now spoiling <laughs> the book for everybody, but, well, that happens. It's a long time ago. I mean, come on. Come I on. Guess, it's a, I guess it's, so, a, it's yeah. a great character. I mean. yeah. <laughs> it's a suddenly back to life. That's yeah. fine. He didn't get out of the cock duty car. That's okay. <laughs> All right, don't forget, Monster Calls goes wide this weekend. You go check that out in a theater near you. All right, guys, we reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Natasha, what's in the mailbag today? Okay, Reed writes, hey, Collider crew, Reed here. I've been watching since I was just 10 years old, and now that I'm 13, I'm glad I have a program I can listen to that gets down and dirty in all the movie news. <laughs> My question is, what would you like to see be nominated for an Oscar this year that has barely any chance to be nominated. For me, I would love to see John Goodman nominated for 10 Cloverfield Lane and The Nice Guys be nominated for Best Picture. Mentioned this on yesterday's show, but it bears, I really want to see Stephen Lang nominated for Best Supporting Actor for uh, Don't Breathe. <clears throat> what he did in that movie, the intensity, the power, all that stuff that he brings as the blind man you got to be afraid of. Daredevil yeah. ain't got <laughs> nothing on this guy. Um, I, 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 you know, I don't think he's got any chance. Right. Another film that I don't think has any chance of getting nominated, but I think it should, especially in, in an era where we're nominating 7, 8, 9, 10 film. I, I still stand by Civil War. Mm. I think Civil War is a great movie-going experience. I said on yesterday's show, I'll say it again, not every awards picture has to be about a college dropout who has a heroin addiction while trying to reestablish a relationship with his abusive father. Not every great movie has to be about that. I thought that movie, I thought Civil War was a great experience at the theater. It was a wonderful time. No chance it's going to get nominated, but those are the two that really stand out to me. What about you, Schnapp? Uh, I'll say no chance in hell, but I wish it happened, was uh, Tilda Swinton as the ancient one. I think she was she, great. She, she really, that movie. She was the spine of that film, and she brought what could have been a joke character and brought some kind of gravitas to it. Jeremy? Um, I'd like to see Mel Gibson for Hacksaw Ridge. I don't yeah, think that's going to happen either. I completely agree. But I think he does deserve it. You bring up a great point. Like, yeah, Stephen Lang, what I loved about him in uh, that movie is that he really never lost it. He was he was always like this. <laughs> you know, and he was just the creepiest human you've ever seen. And you bring up a great point, my man, about uh, John Goodman in 10 Cloverfield Lane. It's one of those things where it came out almost a year ago, so no one's going to remember it yeah. by now. But he was so great, and I do think he does deserve a Best Supporting Actor for that. Um, La La Land's going to get some music for sure 
Uh, nice Guys for sure. That's that's a movie that I'd love to see. I love it, Nice it, Guys. It won't. Um, I think I don't know if Sing Street is gonna have because it was too early. But I think Sing Street should be nominated for Best Picture if it's not it's not there. And I know that if we're looking at Best Supporting Actors, I think that the two that are gonna get it from this movie are Jeff Bridges and Ben Foster. But I think Chris Pine is somebody that should at least he be looked at. Very totally. good. Best Chris Pine he's, we've but ever. But can you make the argument that Chris Pine is the lead actor of that film? Not necessarily. Yeah. No, I mean, there is. I mean, it really does I mean, no you, lead. You could. You it could is make, an ensemble you could, film. Yeah. You could make the argument for sure. And I think the other thing is, too, I haven't heard Buzz yet. And I think Jeremy and I have been talking about this with Nocturnal Animals for Michael Shannon. And we thought it was a lock that he was mm -hmm. going to be nominated for Best Supporting Actor. Yeah. Uh, he definitely should be nominated for that. You movie. know, I, Michael Shannon's fantastic. But he, uh, like, to me, he was amazing in that. But he was Michael Shannon. It wasn't like it's, you know, you know what I'm saying? It was like. I, I feel know. like I it's like, I, I guess like that's, it's tough if you're such a great actor where you're just seeing that actor, so. Uh, okay, what's next? Jim writes, now that the WGA nominations have been announced and Deadpool was nominated for Best Ad Ad Adapted for Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick, is there any chance in hell it could receive a Best Screenplay nomination for an Oscar? Best Script noms always seem to include quirky comedies like Borat or interesting stories like Wolf of Wall Street, so I can see it being nominated. Bring the filthy and thanks. Golden Globes giving Deadpool some love means nothing. John always has love for the Globes. The Globes are such garbage. So you're not watching this week. The WGA, <laughs> the Writers Guild of America, nominating the Deadpool. I love this image, by the <laughs> way. This <laughs> picture is great. Uh, them nominating it? Look, I still think it's a very slim chance. But... Two days ago, I think it's no chance. The WGA nominates it? Maybe? I mean, look, everybody knows the love I have for Dead, the, the Deadpool. And I thought the, the underpinning, yes, of course, it's Ryan Reynolds. and Brent, But the underpinning was the guys Ryan Reynolds hired to write it. This script gave you a ridiculous, ridiculously irreverent comedy while giving you a legit love story that you actually felt. Well, while giving you all these different characters, it's a really great script. I still, I wouldn't put money on it. I still don't think it'll get nominated for an Oscar. But the fact that the WGE nominates it gives me a sliver of hope. Christian, am I foolish to even have a sliver of hope? Uh, no, because I'm going to go ahead and I'll be the idiot on the panel that does it. It's getting nominated. You think so? It's getting nominated. And I'll tell you, I think that I think it's going to be one of these things to where the complaints have always been through the Academy. You never move, nominate movies like this. You know, you know. And, and one of the main things that was talked about from the second this thing caught fire in February last year was how great the writing was and how clever it was and how it poked fun at, uh, fun at itself. And that the fact that the rated R thing couldn't happen, but because it was so clever and then when it did, and it's the highest rated R rated uh, superhero movie. It's all going to have merit, and I think people are going to be talking about it. And I think the fact that the Writers Guild did nominate it, and the fact that the Globes, I think it did, it is going to have a little bit. I do think it will get nominated. It doesn't have a chance in hell of winning, but it will be nominated. Jeremy, I would love to see like about twenty monocles fall out of people's eyes, just like, <laughs> you know, when it gets. I would love for it to get nominated. I mean, like I always say, I'm an optimist. I'm not that hopeful because the Academy is net like. In a situation like this, I, I can't think of a scenario where I was like, that, oh, thank God, you know? So I, I'm with you that it's impressive that it got uh, nominated for this. It does speak to, uh, it, it, it makes the odds a bit higher, but whether or not, I, I, I can't actually put my money on but it. But remember, Keep though, this mind. We, did, we did that crash course. I was about to yeah. say that exact same thing. Remember, the writer's nominated. Yeah, it's true. It is the writing segment of yeah. the Academy mm -hmm. that puts forward the nominations. Yes. Now, the whole Academy will vote on the winners, yes. mm -hmm. but the directors nominate the directors. The writers nominate the writers. So, I, yeah, I snap. I think and writers it, appreciate and that movie. Yeah, yeah, and it's very rare. Like, I mean, I think it was last year when uh, the Directors Guild nominated Ben Affleck, but he wasn't nominated. No, no, the Directors Guild awarded yeah. Ben Affleck Best Director, and yet the directors didn't nominate right. him. Yeah, so I, I with, don't get with that. this context, I mean, we, we're at a 50-50 chance. It's hard to tell. You go as high as 50-50. Yeah. I, th I mean, it's like, I, I, you know, the WGA has, has nominated Deadpool, so I don't see why they would say, the, the rest of the Academy would say no. Like you're, like you're saying, usually it's the categories nominate, and then it moves forward, and then everybody votes. So it's got a really big chance. I, how great would I would love to see <laughs> They deserve it, so it, though. Much. It's a really well-written script. Yeah, I, I mean, totally agree. All right, guys. So I said we'd save some time to take some of your live Twitter questions, and we'll do that right now. Wendy, what have you picked out? First one comes from Robert Charles Young, who writes, When reviewing a film, do you look up what other people have written or said so you can back up your points more? 
no, uh, no, no, no. I, I, I don't want anything getting in my head, and so I just stay away from all of it until I do my review, and I'm like, okay, let's see what happens. I probably should because a couple times I've said what someone else said accidentally. It's like, oh, well, but it, it better that you didn't watch it. Yeah, then. facts yeah, line yeah. up. It's like facts are facts, and like minds will will think alike. But I don't like anything getting in my head because I might view it differently, and that's just not how you want to do Schnapp. it. Sometimes it's difficult. I mean, if like you haven't seen a film for a while and uh, ever all your pals have seen it and they talk about it, it could alter the way you feel about it. Like sometimes I'm in direct, you know, like I don't agree with, you know, uh, the opinions, but maybe it's because I've something has been built up when someone else saw it completely fresh with no build up. So that does affect you in certain ways, but I try to not uh, listen or, or look at other reviews before I see a film if possible. Yeah, I, I'm the same as Jeremy. I don't, I, when before Mark and I do a review, we don't look at written reviews don't watch any videos and then afterwards i'll check out yeah. jeremy i'll check out some other people and see if we're on the same page or afterwards but because i think many times you and i have said similar yeah. things we're like oh i didn't check it until afterwards <laughs> yeah, and right. it's like well yeah that just means that i think that makes more that you're on the same page or not on the same page mm -hmm. yeah it is a lot of fun too yeah. when you put out your review you're like all right let's see what this person said whoa we were way off or right. whoa, whoa, we right. were right there you know it's pretty fun see, i i just i love movie reviews mm -hmm. I, so i yeah i do read and, and watch a lot of movie reviews from a lot of different people but it never at all affects what i ended up liking because i really don't care i mean schnepp tells me he loves a movie that's great i love knowing that schnepp loved a movie but it's not going to affect whether or not i love a movie um at the same time so i, I think that's probably goes for most of us here mm -hmm. all right what's next adam johnson writes why do films have a limited release and not just release wide right away especially during oscar season well i mean keep this in mind releasing a film costs a lot of money it costs a lot of money to release to release films, especially why. So what what a lot of times, sometimes a lot of films are created to have limited releases and then live on uh, direct home video or whatever. And by having a theatrical release, it actually helps in the promotional and the marketing of that video as opposed to where they're just going straight to video in the first place and not having a theatrical release. Sometimes, like in the case of La La Land, they like to roll them out slow would just put them in like 15 theaters, get people buzzing about it, then expand it to 300 theaters. And then people who are living like Tucson are going, why can't I see this movie? And then they roll it out wide and they get to see it. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a number of circumstances where Hollywood will use that as a strategy to build momentum. But it's like a lot of things in the movie business. There's not one general rule. There's different reasons why different studios will roll different films out from small to large. I don't know, Schnapp, what do you do? Thing. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you got it like from the gamut of like at the end of December, you have the rollout for the Oscar buzz. Right, yes. So that's why like American Sniper, they rolled it out in like five theaters and people were like, then it just exploded. Not only did it get amazing reviews, but everybody wanted to see it when it actually got its wide release January 14th. So that worked to its favor. You have other films like that get dumped in January, whether it's limited release or like, can let's just get it in 3,000 theaters and before anybody knows. Or, you know, it's like, yeah. can we get any money on this you know, gigantic bomb or like super write-offs that we've, you know, talked about already. That's the other. So that, that runs the gamut. There's also a deadline, right? Like in order to be uh, nominated for an Oscar into for 2016, yeah, you, you have, have to have get a movie out by... Yeah. Minor by the end of the calendar year. And so that has to be in Los Angeles? And or New York. Yeah, New York. Or New York. Or New York. Right, so. one theater in Los Angeles, one theater in New York that the paying public can go and see it. Okay, so that's also another limited release thing that happens a lot at the end of the year. Yeah, and all, we think about it too for business-wise. I mean, look at a lot of the movies that are coming out this week. A lot of them came out yeah. limited release in December. That's also because there's a lot of crap that comes out in January. Let's face it. A yeah. lot of the market they the studios will put some of the a lot of the horror movies some 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 horror movies some movies that just, like I don't think Monster Trucks is going to be that great. Sorry. <laughs> so that movie comes out soon. Those types of movies come out. So then the studios now can put the really good movies in the wide release. And because of the Oscar buzz that it has, more people are more likely to see it because when they're putting it in limited release in December, you're competing with things like Rogue One and you're competing right. with things like Sing to where you're not competing with that now once you put it in January. In January, in the wide release, you've got a better chance of that movie now doing better because of the marketing buzz that it already had with possible Oscar consideration. All right, let's take two more. All right, Tobias writes, what instantly take you out of a movie? For me, it's the Wilhelm, Wilhelm scream. It's so annoying. I love it. I love the Wilhelm. I, I love the Wilhelm scream. That doesn't take me out of a movie. What usually takes me out of a movie at this point are the overused cliches. And, and here's, here's the one. I've got a whole list of them. Um, but here's the one that really drives me crazy. And it's this one. And it's used in so many movies, it's nuts. Okay, I find out that Jeremy 
Hey, to say this is a movie, I find out that Jeremy, who's good friends with Schnepp, is actually plotting to murder Schnepp. All right? Well, don't tell him. And no. I find out. God. So I call Schnepp. Schnepp, what are you doing? Hey, what's up, man? It's weird that I'm using my hand as a phone, but just forget about that. How's it going? Listen, I found out something unbelievable and horrible. What? Did you see uh, the rings? What happened? <laughs> Not over the phone. Meet me at midnight at the cliffs. Oh, the cliffs. All right, I'll be there. Great. See you then. Boom. And now you know what's going to happen. Jeremy's going to kill me. <laughs> Mr. Banks? Banks? Who is it? Mary Poppins is coming, Mr. Banks. But we see We're going to kill him. All the time where it's like, I just found out something. What is it? Not now. Why not now? Right. What could possibly hurt for you telling me right now? And I see it like... Three out of every ten movies I see, that little like gimmick pulls right. me out of a movie. We instantly. need to move on to the next scene. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> Jump scares are starting to annoy me. Obviously, like I oh, said, yeah. I, I can John Williams it now at right? this point. <laughs> Absolutely, it, it, those, those get me. But the other thing is, you know, going off of that point, it's when and a lot of times it happens in a horror movie. But it's like, or, or something, or even in like a supernatural movie where something is happening, the person's like, "Oh, you're crazy." You're crazy. You're not. About, no, no. But, but you just saw the walls bleed with me. No, right. there, was, there, there was something rusty pipes. Right. You're, you're crazy. And right. it's like, no, she's not crazy. You're an idiot. and You're gonna die in the next scene, and everyone knows it. Yeah, horror movies have the biggest cliches that take anybody out of a movie. Jump scares. Um, when the trap door opens up, like, all right, let's go down there, or let's split up in a slasher flick. You know, that's why I loved Cabin in the Woods because it made fun of all that stuff. Yeah. That and gimmicks. I don't know why someone thought of D box and thought it was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah, though D-Box, even if it sucks, is sometimes good. If you're seeing a, a really bad movie in D-Box, you're like, why am I rotating? You know, just, right. Well, the camera's moving. I don't understand why I'm shaking. It's very weird. I, I say D-Box all the time. There's um, another one that takes me out. There's another cliche thing that takes me out every single time. It happens all the freaking time, okay? So let's get into our movie again. John Schnepp is our hero. He's the hero, right? And uh, let's say for whatever reason, uh, Natasha's in the movie as well, okay? And Natasha is the focus of Schnepp's uh, unrelinquished re re love. He wants, he wants her, but she has a boyfriend, obviously, Aww. who is Christian. <laughs> now remember, Schnepp is the hero of the movie, so you want to take a guess what kind of guy Christian is in the movie? He's a jerk. I've Get in the car now! <laughs> yes! <laughs> the existing boyfriend is a jerk because... In normal life, him trying to mack another guy's girlfriend, he's an asshole. Right, I'd be the jerk. But he's the hero of the movie, so we have to be sympathetic. So the existing boyfriend or husband. I'm has Bradley to... Cooper from Wedding Crashers. Yes! Uh, yeah. That's a perfect example but he's great of it. In that movie. That shtick takes me out of a movie completely. Well, in that scenario, you can find me playing board games with my friends on Friday night. <laughs> Tell me you're my cousin. For me, it's. Uh, <laughs> it's. No. Uh, oh, call back. Back. <laughs> All right, fist bump yeah, was good. <laughs> no, was good. I'm just going to say bad CG. <clears throat> when you see oh, bad oh, compositing yeah. or bad graphics nowadays, especially if it's a car or a building and that looks fake, there's no. that's when you're like, yo, this is like a bad sci-fi channel. It's uh, <laughs> 2 in the morning. So, uh, uh, The other thing I put on my list before, too, is sex scenes in movies, like spontaneous oh. sex scenes in movies. Because spontaneous sex scenes, like the the couple at the party, I'm not acting this one. And they no, no, no <laughs> acting this one. Out. I'm not going to say anybody's example. They slip into the closet for a second, come out. Guess what? Sex is messy, and there's no going breeze into a closet at a formal affair and breeze out and everything's fine and just just touch your hair up. That pulls me out too, and they, all the movies do it. All right, last question of the day. You mean you don't you don't look like that after sex? <laughs> Like everybody else? All right. <laughs> Jason Heron writes, are you guys going to do a live Oscar show this year? Um, we are, it's funny because we just talked about this. Uh, we had a meeting about this yesterday. We don't know 100% yet what our plans for the Oscars are, but we can say that live broadcasting during the Oscars is absolutely going to be a part of it. So we don't know exactly what our plans are yet, but there will be there will probably be an Oscar pre-show. There will probably be some live broadcasting during the Oscars, and there will probably be a brief after show as well. Um, where we're going to do it, how we're going to do it, uh, what location we're going to do it in, we're not 100% sure of all that yet. But, uh, yeah, you're damn right. Spend the Oscars with us because we're going to have a lot of fun that night. All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of the Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting over there, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. 
Right beside me is Mr. Jeremy Johns. You can find me uh, on at Jeremy Johns on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, at Real Jeremy Johns on Facebook, and playing board games with my friends on the weekends who don't live here. I don't have friends down here in Los Angeles. <laughs> That's not true. We're your friends. Hey, come on. You want to play board games? Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> Sitting beside me, we got Christian Harloff. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, Christian Harloff. And like John mentioned before, the return of Collider Jedi Council, that is today. Make sure you check that out. And we will be talking everything Star Wars, obviously. Over there, Natasha Martinez. Natasha, where can people find you? You guys can find me adding that acting performance to my resume. And you can also <laughs> find me on Twitter and Instagram at Natasha Lexus underscore. And right beside her is Wendy Lee. You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you can simply follow me on Facebook and on Twitter just at John Camby. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.